Welcome to the Main Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. I am delighted that the podcast is back, and this episode is not only deeply inspiring, it's a fantastic mix of new, cutting-edge science merged with a keystone species that is holding on for dear life. I spoke with University of New England professor Tom Clack in early August about his work on restoring the American chestnut, and his passion and belief in this project is palpable. One of the coolest parts of our conversation is hearing Tom talk about how his career and research interest has changed throughout his experience. He hasn't stayed in one sliver of an area like many academic researchers, but he has traveled along a continuum of research that has changed as his interests have evolved. And during our conversation, Tom said one of the things I love to hear, especially from a Maine scientist. This is very cool. It's never been done before. I've included Tom's contact information in the show notes so you can get in touch with him in case you have information about wild chestnuts in your area. I've also included a link to the American Chestnut Foundation. One note before we get to the conversation, as the episode progresses, you'll hear more than a few birds in the background. I kept them in because I think it is not only delightful, but a truthful representation of Tom and part of what drives his work. So Tom, welcome to the Main Science Podcast. I am delighted to have you, um, especially on a summer day when I know you could probably be out with the trees if you had your choice. Before we dive into your exceptional work with the American chestnut, I would like to know how you got to Maine because I know that like me, you are not a native to Maine, but have claimed Maine as your home for some time. So if you could just give us a quick background on how now, you got here and we were lucky enough to have you. So I've been yeah in Maine for now um, 11 summers and I, as a, a field person and as a nature and outdoor person, I count my time here in summers <laughs> because there's so much going on um, during the summertime when all, all my plant relatives are, are growing and doing great things. Yeah, so I've kind of basically drifted eastward over my decades. Believe it or not, kind of started in um, the totally contrasting urban environment of Chicago. So I was born and raised in Chicago, inside the city. And so I have that, you know, urban experience, density of buildings and people and cars and noise and all that as my alternative uh, reality to Maine. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have settled here. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm not from Maine, but I got here as fast as I could. So, uh, so yeah, so Illinois, growing up, undergraduate um, degree from a small school in Western Illinois called Augustana College. Then a little bit north up to um, Madison, uh, to the University of Wisconsin for uh, my graduate degrees. Then began um, the serious shift eastward, uh, first to uh, Ohio State for a while, and then to Miami of Ohio, to um, pro- public schools in the uh, Ohio system. And combined between them, I was there about 20 years, no wait, 25 years, 25 years between the two schools. And then, um, then, then coming to Maine, uh, my wife is also an academic uh, and slash administrator. So that was the key to bringing us to Maine in her administrative um, capacity. Uh, so I was pulled along uh, in a very happy way <laughs> to this wonderland of, of nature. So in your previous work, I alluded to it, we, we're going to talk a lot about chestnuts and, and the rejuvenation hopefully of the American chestnut. When you were making your way eastward, were you working with plants or were you working on something else? Um, basically, my, my life has evolved intellectually and, and purposefully more and more towards doing things positive or trying to do things positive for the environment. So simultaneous as we, you know, we just yesterday got the new IPPC report from the United Nations indicating, you know, even more dire uh, warnings about the direction we're going, the amount of heat buildup and how we need to take um, drastic action immediately. Um, So as those kinds of things are um, coming out in the science, not that we didn't know about um, climate change for many decades earlier, but um, but certainly the information is becoming more clear, more uh, multifaceted, checked in more ways, more data, everything is becoming clearer and clearer about how we need to do um, more to um, 
protect the environment, to uh, curb our greenhouse emissions and all the rest. So all of, while th all that is happening, my own involvement, my own interests have shifted more and more towards doing something about it. Um, so my, my education is actually in, in the field of geography, which is a very broad field. So it's both human geography and physical geography. So it's the kind of thing that if somebody like me seems to be kind of interested in everything. It gives you the, the ability to move around quite comfortably from topic to topic, issue to issue, kind of following your nose. So that's, so that's where this environmental interest has become more and more crucial to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis over, over the decades. I think it's interesting that your background is in geography because I would hazard a guess that most people don't realize that that's still something that one can major in or and focus on. It, it is the United States is a little different than mo many other industrialized countries in that regard. Um, having taught in Britain, for example, geography is very in a really important field of study there in many other parts of the world, Canada included. So a bit of an outlier in terms of geographical education. So before I let you, before we get to the meat, what, what is it about the other parts of the world that geography is used for that we don't use it for? Boy, that's a, that's a tough question there. Well, you start me off on a tough one there, Kate. I'm doing my best, Tom. I'm going to keep you on your toes, even though it's the summer. Yeah. Well, you know, you, there's a lot of things to say about that. I think it, it is definitely in part the kind of the insular nature of American culture that we kind and it comes up in a lot of different ways. I'm sure if people think about this, that we tend to kind of think that everything we need to know is within our boundaries. Whereas I think the rest of the world it, it appreciates more the interconnectedness of the world and how what is happening in other places matters a, a, a ton, a, a lot to what's happening to you. And so I think that that more worldly perspective elsewhere um, encourages a geographical education, whereas here in the United States, um, less so. Although there are really good geography programs in the United States, and the one I came from at the University of Wisconsin is, is one of them, uh, top notch. So the geography is a broad base and has allowed you to slowly figure out how you want to focus your career now, which will lead us to what most of our conversation I hope is about, which is the American chestnut and your work. So before we get into your work explicitly, maybe you can give us a broad overview of the history of the American chestnut and why your work is as, as vital as it is right now. Okay. So, nice, easy one for you. A big one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to be very focused and succinct about this. And it's really important what you're asking, Kate, because that's one of the major issues we're facing right now with the chestnut, but uh, with a lot of things in that our environment has changed so profoundly around us that people today have little grasp of what it used to be like. We, in, in ecology, there's a term for that called shifting baseline syndrome. And shifting baseline syndrome is, is this idea that a person judges the environmental health and quality around them based on their own personal experience of what they've seen and what they know. Um, so I'm looking out at trees as we speak right now that look pretty good size. They might be uh, 12 inch, 16 inch in diameter. They may be, in fact, my son and I just the other day were measuring some of the trees in my backyard. So they're, they're 90 feet tall. Okay, so I'm looking out at a, a white pine as an example, kind of putting in a, the chestnut issue. I'm not forgetting your question, but putting in a little bit broader uh, context. So I'm looking out at a 90 foot tall um, white pine tree, which looks pretty impressive. What about what white pines were like in 1600, where a tree that was 200 feet tall or more was common? Okay, just think, think, uh, try to imagine a really big, tall white pine that you've seen and double it in size. It's hard to do, hard for one to imagine. And that's because we can't grasp what the environment used to be like before the massive transformation that uh, we've done to it. 
in the way we manage the land, the way we accidentally do things, you know, purposefully or inadvertently, we have changed and, and, and reconstituted nature around us so profoundly. And I think that's something that hardly anybody grasps in its totality. And I think just average daily thinking about things, we, we don't think about it uh, much at all. In the background, you're hearing a downy woodpecker serenading, serenading me. <laughs> I had heard the birds earlier and I was trying to figure out what that one was. That's really neat. <laughs> I'm out, as, you, as, as this discussion suggests, I'm out in nature as much as I possibly can. So, okay, so, so nature, point of making nature thoroughly, profoundly transformed by humans, particularly in the post-colonial period, we have a very hard time even imagining what it would have been like for a billion passenger pigeons to fly overhead for a day or more, darkening the sky. Um, and, so, and so with the American chestnut tree, it's like people say, well, American chestnut tree, what's the point of it? American chestnut tree was a keystone species of the Eastern US forest from Maine to Georgia and across to Indiana. 200 million um, acres of land were uh, largely dominated by the American chestnut tree. Again, let's not forget that this Eastern US was a forested landscape. A lot of it is not forested anymore. Maine has been reforested, but that's, that's unusual. Um, and even aren't the trees that we have here are, are not, um, we don't have any of the original trees. These are all second, third, fourth generation uh, cutovers and, and, and regrowth. So, so the whole idea that the American chestnut tree was absolutely crucial to the ecology of the Eastern US and to the cultures of the people that inhabited the Eastern US, whether it's the Native American peoples or the post-colonial peoples, people now today, they, they don't realize it. They don't get it. They don't, they don't imagine it, but it was. It was one out of four trees in the Eastern United States. They grew to well over a hundred feet tall. They grew to 10 feet in diameter. Can you imagine trees of 10 feet in diameter? No, we can't. Again, shifting baseline syndrome. It wasn't only the, the chestnut. Cause so you can imagine it again, it's hard for us to imagine what the, what the native forest of the primeval forest of the Eastern United States was like, where you had oaks and hemlocks and tulip trees and, uh, and on and on and hot chestnut trees that were 10 feet in diameter. It's just mind boggling. So the point I'm making is that in order to bring back the American chestnut tree and bring back, uh, increase the ecological health of our landscape around us for everybody's benefit and for nature's benefit, we need to reconnect with what things were like. And so that's part of what we're trying to do is to teach people about how important the American chestnut was on the landscape. So it was really important back uh, all the way through to around 1900. Then what happened was people, people in this country like to bring in things from other parts of the world. They like, you know, the exotic, but even to this day, I mean, you look at people's yards, people want to grow unusual things, things that are different than everybody else, than, in, than their neighbors. And in that, they brought in um, the species of chestnuts um, from other parts of the world, particularly the ones from Asia. There's a Chinese chestnut species and there's a Japanese chestnut species. And there's a history to why that was, partly because they were different and people like Thomas Jefferson, you know, liked to grow the other, the other chestnut trees from other species in, at Monticello back in the 1700s. But in particular, let me focus on the Japanese chestnut that people brought in. If you go back to trying to see well, why, there is a really crucial document that was written in 1898 that explained it. Um, and this is sort of, you know, in, uh, agricultural document coming out of what not what now is the University of Delaware and people and the guy was writing about this and he's saying the Japanese chestnut has some advantages over the American chestnut the the nuts mature qu quicker and they're a little bigger and that would be great for the market so we could bring these Japanese chestnuts to the market before the American chestnuts because you know chestnuts roasting on an open fire again we have little vestiges of our 
our cultural connection to the chestnut still in, in our in our language today. So the idea was let's bring these other ones to the market and we can beat the market, win the market over the American chestnuts. Well, in short, what they brought along with the Japanese chestnut was a was a fungus. It's called Cryphonectria parasitica, Cryphonectria parasitica fungus that co-evolved in Asia with the Japanese chestnut and the Chinese chestnut. So those those trees co-evolved with the fungus and learn to adapt to the fungus and tolerate the fungus. The American chestnut had never been exposed to it until the late 1800s. And by 1904, it was first discovered. It was around for a couple decades already, but it was first discovered in the Bronx. And then after that, it's, it spread vigorously throughout the East uh, until over the next 50 years. Um, and killed um, up to 4 billion American chestnut trees because American chestnut tree had no, no ability to, to tolerate the fungal blight. And so to this day, then, that's what we're dealing with. The fungal blight, we have no protection from in our, in our American chestnut species, had no exposure prior to it. And so then now many decades, many, many decades of work, how, what do we do about it? How do we bring the tree back? That's the question right up until today. So the chestnut tree, um, you know, provided food, uh, habitat, really great lumber. And if I recall correctly, it, it also has an extraordinary capability for carbon sequestration and capture, uh, which is, you know, much more of a more modern application and understanding of how we, how we look at trees and forests nowadays. So I'm, I'm assuming all of those things are part of the motivation for bringing it back. So if you could talk a little bit about the, why you want to bring it back and how you're doing that. We'll just dive right into the science part. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, so, and again, I think it's, it's a normal question for people to ask that, well, if you're going to try to make our landscape healthier around us, why pick this one species? Why, you know, what's so special about it? Well, it really is special. And I, I would argue that, and I'm not the only one that's ever said this, that if you, if you had to choose one tremendous challenge to reverse a, a major ecological disaster, you would have a hard time in, 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 in the Eastern uh, North America where we are to, to find another species that would have a bigger impact than bringing back the American chestnut tree for its ecological relationships, as well as its, its human relationships. So I, I really think about it as being kind of the miracle tree. I like to refer to it as the miracle tree. Why? Because, you know, it has so many features that are just plain outstanding. You mentioned car carbon sequestration. I'm not saying that it's the answer to the fact that we're up now at what 415 uh, parts per million in carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere more than and any time in the last million years. I'm not saying that it's going to solve that problem by any means, but it it is a contributor to solving that problem because it grows really fast. When it grows fast, it takes carbon. It it, it its growth is carbon. Um, and it holds that carbon. It has um, a very deep taproot. Um, so that tree is not likely to get blown down like a white pine. In fact, I've seen you know occasions when winds blow down white pines into chestnut trees and, and break them off, but don't knock the tree down. <laughs> and so I've, one, of my, one of the trees that I harvest nuts from and, and work on in our, in our uh, transgenic, transgenic breeding program we'll talk about in a moment. We call it the whacked tree. <laughs> it the whacked tree because a white pine blew it down, what, smashed into it in October 2017. People from Maine will remember the massive wood storm we had uh, in the eastern, uh, southeastern part of the state. <clears throat> so giant white pine crashed into this uh, chestnut tree, broke off the top about 40% of it but it's still alive and it's got this pointy tip to it. So that's the whacked chestnut tree. So, so it's, a, it's a strong tree, it's a durable tree, it is um, uh, rot resistant. So there's a lot of chestnut wood today that goes back to a previous use. So back in the day, again, this is all things that it's, is kind of pretty much unknown to a lot of Americans. Chestnut was used in all aspects of life 
you know, you, they talk about, you know, the, the cradle, the grave um, tree, cradle, the coffin tree, fence posts were made out of it. Railroad ties were made out of it. Cabins and homes were made out of it. <clears throat> barns were made out, out of it. Barns are still standing today that were made out of chestnut that, were, that was built in the 1800s prior to the blight. So it was a um, tremendously useful, durable tree that can even be used a second time. So there's what's called wormy chestnut today. And they call it wormy because sometimes there are little beetle holes, little beetle holes that don't really affect the, the durability of the wood. It's not quite as strong as oak, but it's lighter than oak. And so it, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite an amazing tree in that regard. And since it grows so quickly, it can draw a lot of carbon out of the air and keep it there where we need to keep it, um, either in, in the form of carbon or um, and the, the tree itself or in the ground. So, so it really has that, that value. And we can go on um, to other aspects of its value. Let me mention one other quick one is that back in the 1800s, um, the main source of tan, tannin for the leather industry was chestnut. So the, it, that's a t reason why um, chestnuts are so, so rot resistant, insect resistant, is because they have a lot of tannin. And it's similar to oaks have a lot of tannin. Try to, try to bite into a red oak acorn and you know what we're talking about. Uh, so it was used to tan hides. That's, that was the main source of, of leather tanning was the chestnut. So we've lost a lot of that value of the chestnut from um, going up until, you know, basically 1900. And there's some, you know, a lot of stories in the first half of the 1900s in, in NCY it has some beautiful paintings, but are also sad paintings called The Last of the Chestnuts, where, you know, he, he, he depicted people cutting down their last chestnuts that had died, you know, and that was it. That was the end of the, end of the story. So, so anyway, we need to reverse that. And I think doing that is going to be one of the, and here we are, the Blue Jays are in the background. I love them. And the Blue Jays are so crucial. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around here, but I think for one, you're realizing how a geographer thinks it's all connected. And for two, it all is connected to the chestnut. So the ch Blue Jays are our, our favorite allies in nature because the Blue Jay will move the chestnut farther than any other species. So squirrel can, can, can cache up uh, chestnuts, and, but they usually cache them in, in bulk. So you might have 20 chestnuts all growing in the same spot. Well, that's not a very good way to do it. The <clears throat> blue jays like to cache them <clears throat> one at a time and they can move them and it's been documented even though we have so few chestnuts on the landscape. This has been documented in small studies. So the blue jay can move them a kilometer per year and uh, and they plant them individually. And if somebody see if she, if the blue jay sees another blue jay watching them, they'll move it again into somewhere else. Um, and the majority now some of this research has been done with acorns with with oak acorns. But since the acorn and the the um, chestnut along with the beech are all part of the same uh, family, the Fagaceae family, they're very similar trees and they share a lot of properties. So, so the blue jay will forget most of the individual acorns that it plants. I mean, that's, that's still really cool. If they, they can find 45% of them planted over a radius of one kilometer, that's really, that's really amazing, right? Just try it. Let, let's, anybody try that themselves. Plant, put Put a hundred acorns in the ground over the, you know, a widespread to see how many more you can. I, I tried that myself just off, off the side of my house and I couldn't find it 10 feet away from the house. And I thought I really knew where it was. So the blue jay is amazing that way. It leaves some behind and it's the great planter of, of chestnut trees and other Pagaceae family trees. And so when we get to the public availability of the American chestnut tree that has blight, fungal blight tolerance, my ally is going to be the blue jay, along with other people, many people as well. But the blue jay is going to be crucial to bringing the chestnut back to the landscape. So that's where that loud noise, I guess I'm going to go, ties in beautifully with our conversation. <laughs> I love the idea of having multiple species allies to make this happen. And blue jays get a bad rap because people think they're they're noisy and things. So I think they're just really smart and cool. So we should we should try to appreciate every species for for what they have to offer and what they're what they're about. 
Okay, so let's dive into what you're doing. So I'm going to I'm going to try to try to give you what my understanding is of the of the different ways that we're trying that are being tried to revive the chestnut and and you're going to correct all of my mistakes and and make <laughs> make it more understandable. So there's you know, even though the blight has affected the chestnut, uh, there's there are still some trees surviving and they they are there is a, a a multitude of programs where they're crossbreeding the chestnuts that have survived. And what I'm not entirely clear on, are, are, are they crossbreeding them with other chestnuts that have survived or if they are crossbreeding them with some of the Asian based chestnuts, original chestnuts to hope that they can get whatever it is that provides the protection against the blight. What you're doing is a totally different method in that you're still utilizing genetics um, but you are skipping, you're not skipping steps. You're making it go faster by specifically incorporating gene- genes into the chestnut trees that you know are resistant to the blight. And in your case, they're from wheat. Do I have this right? Yep. It's pretty good summary there, Kate. Okay. Let's move on to the next topic. Okay. No, okay. Great. That was, yeah. that was no. it. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Well, <laughs> uh, let, let me just say a, a couple of extra words about the two different ways that people are working really hard uh, to bring back the American chestnut tree. The breeding method you mentioned is mainly involving trying to bring over the genes from the Chinese chestnut species that protects that tree in its native habitat and had had co-evolved, this tree had co-evolved with this, with the fungal blight um, over millions of years. The Chinese chestnut tree and the American chestnut tree were separated for 40 million years of evolution. So you can imagine that um, the species are, have a lot of you know, alleles, a lot of mutations that are different from one another over that long span, span of time. So they're typically in co-evolution situations. This is broadly something that happens in nature in general. Plants can't move, so they come up with ways to protect themselves against things that are wanting to eat them or consume them. And that's exactly the case with this fungal blight, this fungus called Cryphonectria parasitica. So the way in which the Chinese tree protects itself is through an, an array of different parts of its its genome. So we know there are 12 um, chromosomes on a chestnut tree, whether it's the Chinese, the American, they both have 12 chromosomes. And we know of nine regions of the Chinese chestnut chromosome, uh, g- uh, genome and its chromosome. Nine, nine of those chromosomes of the 12 have places in them that are contributing to that blight tolerance. Okay, so why am I saying that? Because then the challenge is, how do you bring over genes from nine different regions of a genome? Obviously, the question then has arises, and it's a good one. So which ones are really important? Historically speaking, in other other words, over recent decades, before, before really the genomic revolution. We're in the genomic revolution in science and medicine right now, and I'm sure that topic comes up so much in your podcasts, Kate. So we're in the genomic revolution. We know stuff today that we didn't know 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it's just startling and totally transformative in terms of science in medicine, medical science. Um, So what, what the genomic revolution has meant for chestnut restoration is that the previous thinking, which was based only on observ- observing chestnuts in the breeding program, breeding the American and the Chinese together and looking at the offspring over generations and thinking, well, how many genes does it seem to matter? Uh, how many genes are there on the Chinese tree that, that matter? And the thinking was that it was only two or three genes out of <clears throat> over 35,000 genes. Now we know that's wrong. Now we know, like I said, it's, it's nine regions or loci on the Chinese um, genome. (laughs) And so it's way more than two or three. And so that's what's the challenge of that particular approach to chestnut restoration. What are the genes? How many are there? What are they, which ones um, do we need? And how to do, how to move them over through breeding, which is kind of a, a core, a, 
a coarse way of trying to get to a solution, right? Because you can't control what comes over from the Chinese parent versus the American parent, right? Those two, you know, DNAs get get combined. And if they, I'm going to just ask you, if they've been separated for 40 million years, it's not surprising that there's that many differences then, is there? I mean, that, that seems like that would make sense. And, you know, theoretically you would need not maybe as long to get them back together, but certainly a really long time. Yeah. And, well, you really, and, and if, if they've, co- they've evolved in different regional contexts for that long, there's a lot of stuff that is in the Chinese chestnut genome that you really don't want in this other context because you want to maximize the genes of and the genome that has evolved in situ in the Eastern United States in the context around. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, what the, 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 the climatic conditions, the environmental conditions, the droughts, the floods, the variability of weather, uh, you know, the different pests that are, of, you know, you, you want things, you want some insects to eat them for sure, because that's, that's the ecological relationships that are crucial to nature, but you don't want the tree to, to be consumed 100% so it dies, right? You want, you want a little bit of, of the uh, insect consumption and the larvae are crucial, of course, to feeding birds and that whole um, set of, um, of connections, which is, you know, the basis of uh, nature. So you want that, um, but you don't want a whole, most of what would be coming over from the Chinese genome you wouldn't want here, uh, including the fact that the Chinese tree is a short tree and the American chestnut tree is a giant tree, a tall canopy tree. So one of the challenges of, of, um, of breeding is to breeding over the genes that help to make the tree tolerate the blight and, and keep the blight from killing, the fungal blight from killing the American chestnut tree. But you want the stature of the American chestnut tree, which is a dominant canopy tree. In order to function and survive in nature, it has to grow to over 100 feet tall to compete with the other, you know, dominant trees. And, and that sort short stature is something you have to breed out and you don't want to carry over. So those are some of the challenges of that particular approach to chestnut restoration. The people are working very vigorously on right now. And I'm working on another one. Right. So that leads to my next question is right. what, you know, let's, let's talk about the gene in the grass and, and what it is exactly that you're doing. Okay. So, so another parallel method to um, restore the American chestnut and and it's important to note that both the two methods, the one I just mentioned with the Chinese uh, chestnut breeding, and now what I'm what I'll call the transgenic approach, and I and I'm calling it transgenic because we're moving a gene. We've moved the gene from one unrelated species, namely wheat, bread wheat, to the to the chestnut. That's called transgenesis. Um, if you moved if you moved ch- ch- uh, genes from the Chinese, you could do it in the lab because the two species uh, are, can interbreed more or less. Uh, there's a little bit of obstacles. Uh, that's called cisgenesis. So, so, so this is called transgenesis. Okay, so, so the transgenic chestnut is what, what I work with. And the, the work being done to try to bring back the tree through transgenesis has been going on just as long as the other breeding program. A lot of people think, well, this kind of just developed uh, overnight or very recently. No, they've both been going on in parallel since, you know, really the 1980s, 1990s. So, so they kind of have a similar length of history of development and all this stuff in science takes, takes a long time. Things can move much quicker now because of genomics. Uh, and that's a very exciting time to be in science, um, no matter what field you're in. Okay, so so this approach then is has um, and I'm and so much of what I do really piggybacks on the careful science again over decades that has been done in a particular college in Syracuse, New York. It's called the Environmental Science and Forestry College. Okay, so the the, the American Chestnut Restoration Project at um, Environmental Science and Forestry College, ESF for short, ESF, is crucial. And I'm, I'm really an extension of them. I mean, I think we're doing some pretty cool work in Maine now and at the University of New England, but it's, it's 
standing on the shoulders of all the work that's been done over a much longer time at ESF. So I have to give them all the credit in the world for all the work they've done. And we continue to collaborate uh, closely on the projects. Okay, so what we're doing, what, what, when I say we, this is the transgenic team of uh, certainly led by uh, ESF, but other scientists um, throughout the, really throughout the uh, native range. Um, so collaboration with all kinds of people at um, uh, Penn State and the uh, University of Georgia, and certainly the national headquarters of the American Chestnut Foundation in, um, in Meadowview, Virginia. Purdue University is involved. Okay, so lots of different collaborators, lots of different scientists. And what we're doing is working with a chestnut tree that has, has an extra gene. And that gene, it's been discovered, is a very common gene in nature and in uh, domestic food plants like bread wheat. And it's a, it's a different kind of protection mechanism um, against a variety of different uh, fungi. Okay, so again, plants do this just normally to protect themselves um, so that maybe a few uh, species can eat them. You know, you think about the milkweed, which most, most um, insects don't eat, um, but, but the monarch has uh, co-evolved with the milkweed to, to consume it. And okay, so that works out great. So, so most plants then, many, many plants, dozens and dozens of plants in nature, like, like wheat, which of course is a domesticated um, grass, have this gene that, um, that protects them against this, this fungi and other kind, this, this fungus called Graphinetria parasitica as well as other fungi. What, what it does is the, this fungus that kills the chestnut tree does its damage by penetrating through the bark layer of the tree. And the bark layer is kind of your, 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 your wall, your defensive wall of a plant. And it reaches the living layers of, of the tree and it uses oxalic acid. It exudes, the fungus exudes oxalic acid to, um, to break down the cell walls and to kill, kill the tree. And then it's the fungus's mycelium will surround the trunk of the tree and, um, and, kill, and, and separate off and you know, click, kill off the root system from the upper reaches of, of the tree. That's why there are still millions of chestnut trees on the Eastern landscape, but they're almost all stump sprouts. Okay, so the roots will survive. The top of the tree dies from the process I just described. And then the roots survive and then you see shoots coming up from the roots in an attempt to kind of regrow and then eventually the fungus will attack those in the same way it killed the main stem. Um, so that, and those are, are, you know, DNA that's living DNA of the, of the chestnut. So that's cool. So it's not completely uh, extinct from the landscape, but it's functionally extinct. So the term functionally extinct means that it cannot play the ecological role. That it um, that it did prior to the introduction of this imported imported blight. That's what happens, and so that's what this gene does. Again, it's common. It's it's common gene. Um, it's in bananas. It's in strawberries. Two things I've already eaten today. When I had my breakfast. Um, very common azaleas in my backyard here have that gene. All the grasses you see around you, I'm looking at grasses, all have that same gene. It's a very, very common gene, but it doesn't exist in chestnuts. So it's a different way to protect the tree um, by reducing the, the acidity of that oxalic acid. Um, so it doesn't kill the, fungal, the fungus, which is really important. Because if it tried to kill the fungus, then the fungus would try to be clever and mutate around that. All it does is it keeps the chestnut tree from dying, we think so far from based on all the evidence to date. Um, it, it, it reduces the acidity and then the fungal blight can go on its merry way and do other things. It could, we, all, we know that the fungal blight can can reproduce and live perfectly well without killing American chestnut trees. It lives on oaks. It reproduces on oak trees, for example. It doesn't kill the oak trees, but it lives on them. It lives on Chinese chestnut trees. And so it can live what's as a, a, what's called a saprotroph. It doesn't need to be a necrotroph. Necrotroph kills its, 
its uh, its plant and then consumes it. That's what it does to the American chestnut tree. It doesn't have to do that. It can live as a saprotroph, and therefore it won't be encouraged to evolve around the defense mechanism of the of of this uh, wheat gene, which is something we call oxalate oxidase. And that's that's how we reduce the acidity of the oxalic acid that the fungal blight uses. Okay, I have two questions for you. Number one, I'm, a, I'm, I'm working under the assumption that you're talking about how common this gene is so that listeners and other people won't freak out at the other phrase that you've used, which is transgenic. Um, just to explain that it's something that's very common and that we see all the time. That's question number one. My second question is why focus on the grass if you already know that oaks have the same kind of uh, resistance? Is there a reason not to try to duplicate or get some of the some of the genes from the oak and not have it so different species wise? Yeah, I mentioned the oaks that we know that the this fungal blight that kills the chestnut trees lives on the bark of the oak but doesn't penetrate. Okay, so it doesn't kill the oak. Um, so the oak doesn't have the gene that we're talking about. Okay, um, it's just it's yeah. just what we're what we've realized is, is the fungal blight. But by the way, it's just worth mentioning. If we want to bring back the American chestnut tree, we have this imported blight. Well, we might think, well, let's try to get rid of the fungal blight. Well, you can't. It's everywhere. Fungal spores are everywhere around us, um, and that's just there's just no way around that. Once it's in the in in the um, on the landscape in nature, it's it's no it's no limiting. So, you, so it's not going away. It's a matter of trying to give the tree a, a way to defend itself. Why am I mentioning this? This gene is common. Well, just because it is. <laughs> it's just it is common. Um, we use wheat because wheat is the most com- known genome. Y- humans have been studying wheat for for thousands of years, so we know more about the wheat species than we know about any other. Uh, plant species. So, um, but other, another one could have been used. Um, and, uh, and I guess people need to realize that there's no perfect solution to restoring nature or bringing back ecological health. We can't go back. The American chestnut can't survive on its own. Okay. We need to intervene. We've intervened in many ways, oftentimes inadvertently to, to, introduce all kinds of things, right? Because we're talking about something specific today about the keystone species of the American chestnut. You know, but we can talk about many different um, invasive species that we're dealing with right in our own backyards, right? The Asian bittersweet, um, Japanese barberry, you know, garlic mustard, um, the, the, um, the the bush honeysuckles from Asia, on and on and on. You know, we all, we all know these uh, things that are profoundly transforming nature, okay? In all those examples in a really negative way, outcompeting the native species. So we all need to kind of come to grips with the fact that nature has been massively transformed in many cases in a negative way. What can we do? And, and so you can think about our ethical responsibility to do something about it, especially because now we have the ability to do something more so than ever, bo- ever, ever before. It's a very exciting time to be involved in science. So what, what are we going to do about it? We can't go back. We can't just bring back the American chestnut, pure and simple. That's not an option. So it's going to have to be a little bit different because we have this extra element of the landscape of this Crafenetria parasitica fungus that won't allow it to be the keystone species that it once was. So, so that's what we're faced with. And everybody needs to think about that and what they're most comfortable doing. But just letting, I mean, some people would say, just let it go. Um, the issue I have with that is that we're, we've lost something really, really important. The amount of food that a chestnut tree can produce is 100 times what an oak tree can produce. 100 times the mast has been documented. Okay, so oaks often are the ones that have replaced the chestnut on the landscape. And don't forget, you know, we've got a lot of other trees that are on their way out as well. Think about the ash, think about the elm, think about the woolly adelgid affecting the hemlock, as well as the more generalist um, uh, imported pests like the gypsy moth and the brown tail moth. So we've got a lot of different things affecting the health of our forest. We are a forested region. What can we do about it? And this particular approach is, 
is one I think that has has a lot of promise. But we can't go back to the way it was back in 1600. Well, I think um, I think there's real value in using our understanding of, of <clears throat> genetics and nature and and ecology to try to purposefully help as opposed to uh, all the inadvertent mistakes that we've made. Um, there, there is real value in that. And I do know that what you are doing has been, uh, I don't think thoroughly tested and, and reviewed even begins to cover the necessary hurdles that are in place to make sure that what you're doing is safe for everybody involved and, you know, plant and animal alike. I think it's, uh, it's very easy to, to say and wave the magic wand and say, oh, it's been peer reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's been, you know, like you said, 20 or 30 years of really understanding the science. No one, from my, my understanding is no one step that you take can be done without really extensive research showing that it works and what it's doing and it's not threatening things, which as another aside is exactly what these new vaccines have done. You know, everybody, many people who have been worried about the new vaccines think, oh, it's just so fast. Well, this research has been going on for decades. And the problem is that, not the problem, science just goes slow and we don't hear about it till the end. So could you tell us a little bit about your trees and what you're finding so far? Sure. And let me just piggyback just for a second on what you Please. just said. What, what is of concern to everyone is the off-target impacts. Okay, so that's been studied carefully. We continue to study it, w looking at how bees use the pollen from the tree that has the extra gene, and they use it just like they do the wild um, chestnut tree looking at tadpoles eating the detritus, the broken down leaves, tadpoles eat those in our vernal pools. Again, studying those, they eat the, the ones with the extra gene, just like they do the American chestnut. In fact, they grow much faster eating chestnut detritus than they do beech or maple detritus. And so that was kind of an extra revelation that, wow, nature is really missing the chestnut. The tadpoles love, the, like, love to eat them. We need to get them out there to make our tadpoles happier and do better. And so, and, and the mycorrhizae relationships in the soil have been studied carefully. So we need to continue to study these off-target impacts. That's important, super, super important. And we will continue to do that. But those studies have been submitted to the U.S. Department of Agriculture because this transgenic chestnut um, has been submitted for deregulation. And it's up to the federal agencies, the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA are the three that oversee um, genetically engineered plants. And so they're, they are going to make a decision as to whether the, um, the transgenic chestnut is deregulated and made available um, to the general public. I'm going to just confirm when you say off target, these studies are done in controlled environments, right? We're not you know, the vernal pools are in a lab. Is that, or is uh, that? In those, in those cases, in the particular case of these tadpoles that was done in the, in the lab setting, yeah, a controlled yeah. environment, the, the pollen ones were done outdoors. Mm -hmm. so, so we do, we can do some work outdoors under the, under the petition, I'm sorry, the permits we have from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that's why this project is moving forward uh, within Maine under my leadership, under um, permitting that is uh, provided by the USDA while the um, evaluation is, is being done for uh, potential deregulation. Got it. So how are your trees doing with the new breeding program? Great. There's, there's a lot of different aspects of what we're doing. Um, we, we produce pollen from chest, transgenic chestnut trees at the University of New England. So one of the major parts of, of our work and the students that are working with me at the University of New England is to speed breed chestnuts. So we take, we take a chestnut and grow it inside a greenhouse under high intensity lights and fertilizer to try to get pollen from it as quickly as possible in order to advance the generations. It's worth noting that when we talk about the transgenic chestnut, we talk about the insertion of this extra gene from wheat. Once that was done, it was done back in 2012, the seedlings that came out of that 
transformation were identical. They were all clones. So there was just, they were all exactly the same of each other. So ever since then, ever since 2012, the effort has been to genetically diversify, keep the gene that protects the tree from being killed by the fungal blight, but otherwise diversify as much of nature's genetics as possible. And so we're at University of New England and we're, we're working hard to produce pollen from the offspring, the, multi, the generational offspring of that original clone. And each, each generation we can produce is gonna be more diverse, incorporating more genetics from nature in order to, to move away from that, that clonal origin. So we do a lot of that and we work hard at trying to speed up that process. And in fact, we had a breakthrough this year, which is I think very cool. This has never been done before, but a, a, f a female flower that we uh, pollinated with our, with our transgenic pollen in July of 2020. And so it, we gathered the fertile nut around October 1st of 2020 we tested the nut. We have a histochemical assay where we test to see if it inherited the gene. It did. Only half of the nuts inherit the gene. That's really important because half of what we produce are wild type. Okay. They're just wild type. And so we're doing a lot of valuable work to just maintain the species uh, in, in its wild type form without any transformation because half of the offspring are, uh, do not in inherit the, the gene from wheat. So we tested it, did not had the gene. We have to give it a timeout for about two, two uh, months or so. It's a, it's a stratification period. The chestnut won't grow in the fall, unlike say a white oak chestnut or white oak acorn will grow right away in the fall. Chestnut needs a, needs a timeout. By middle of December, we planted it. Uh, by late May, we already had been able to make it a mature tree. <laughs> <laughs> it was only Seriously? two feet tall, right? A mature tree in, in uh, like four months. Uh, and it had catkins, which are the male part of the plant. And we were able to produce pollen and take it out to the field this year. And we sent it to our collaborators all over the Eastern United States. So within one, we call it a chestnut year. A chestnut year is defi defined by, you know, from mid-July in Maine or what, around to the next July. That's a chestnut year. Um, we were able to produce pollen that quickly and that, that advances the generation um, much quicker than has been able to be done before, before it's taken minimum of two years and we, we reduced it to less than a year. So that's pretty exciting. So, so we're doing that and we're breeding them with um, selected wild trees, again, under permit. And the other thing we're doing is continuing over the last many years, I've been involved in this about six years now, continuing to find wild chestnut trees that have survived. So there are still trees out there and some of the listeners may know of them. Let me know if you have a wild tree uh, around you or on your land that, that is producing nuts, we want to find them because that's as crucial as the extra gene that provides the blight tolerance. Just as crucial as that is the genetic diversity that nature has provided, okay? And all those alleles and all those you know, mutations that, um, that nature has provided that protects the, the tree against the vicissitudes of, of climate and what nature has to throw, throw at them. So we, can, we continue to seek out those trees and collect those wild nuts. We grow them out. Um, we've been doing that for years. And then we plant them in, in orchards. We call them germplasm conservation orchards. They're typically about 100. Um, seedlings that are planted in a, in a pretty small confined area. They, the seedlings will represent a wide variety of geographical diversity, certainly Maine, but New England and even beyond. Got trees from Georgia and from Virginia and Tennessee and places like that. And what we're beginning to do then, again, under, under USDA permit is to breed the pollen that we produce at the University of New England that has the gene with the offspring of these wild trees in these orchard settings. And that then, as you can imagine, is vastly increasing the genetic diversity of the American chestnut. And this is going on here and across the country, again, under, under the constraints of permit to try to create a, 
a chestnut that not only can tolerate the blight, but represents the natural genetic diversity that encompasses the native range um, from, again, from here to Georgia and across the, to Indiana. So you said uh, the nuts, only half of them have the gene. How, when you do that orchard, do all the trees make it? No, um, they're dying like crazy to the fungal blight. Yeah, yeah. so it's, you're blight still is, seeing it. Um, oh yeah, it's, it, it'll, you know, it, it, it can attack a tree within a couple of years. Sometimes trees survive. It, it's gonna vary, you know, Nature has a lot of variation to it. Of course, that's how nature works. Uh, but definitely there's a lot of fungal blight. Um, some of our, our, our saplings are beginning to produce female flowers. And so we can pollinate them with our, with our uh, pollen from, from our, our lab conditions. But uh, the fungal blight is there. It, another aspect of the work which we're beginning to get, a, get involved with, and this is sort of another aspect, in fact, just, just kind of as a quick comment about this, we talked about the, the breeding program, we talked about the, the biotech um, approach that we use. The overarching approach that the American Chestnut Foundation uses is called three burr. Um, in, in there, there's, the burr is what the female uh, flower becomes and there's the nuts are inside the burr. So the three bees, three burrs are, um, are the back cross breeding program you mentioned with the Chinese tree. It's the biotech approach that we use. And then the third one is biocontrol. And that's another way to try to protect the tree, which is to infect the fungus with a virus. And that's a, maybe a topic for another <laughs> podcast, but, um, but we're beginning to work with that as well. To, uh, I, we don't see it as a wholesale solution to the problem because we can't get the virus to spread throughout the fungus across the landscape. We can protect a single tree, and I'm mentioning that because that potentially can keep some of our orchard wild type uh, saplings alive long enough so that they can breed. And we'll be doing more of that work next, next summer, we hope, and that's called biocontrol. But, but yeah, so three birds, uh, three breeding bi bio biotechnology and biocontrol United in restoration, you are, that's the three burr. And that's the overarching scientific approach that the American Chestnut um, Foundation is using that we're, we're part of. I could make you talk about this for hours and hours. I won't this time. Um, the, one, the one thing I want to end with is your, how you, I don't know how to put this, how, how you feel about this. Um, you know, it said you've been working on this for six years. I, I think I think it's really innovative and important for all the reasons that you said. And then you add in the coolness of the science and it's even more exciting. But I, I also, I, I could see where there'd be frustration um, at, at doing a bunch of work and then just seeing so many saplings fail. I'm just curious uh, how you feel about it and, and what you're looking forward to for the next year, I guess. Yeah. To see the chestnut, that we know is the mighty chestnut is, should be the mighty chestnut was always the mighty chestnut until the 1904 outbreak of the fungal blight. It's sad to see the trees reduced to nothing but stump sprouts or worse. They, they, they don't survive that either because that stump sprouts will get chewed down by deer and it's not, you know, an understory tree can't survive. It needs, it needs lots of sunlight. It, uh, again, it's a canopy tree. So even the stump sprouts will eventually die. So to see that is sad, but it, but it also is a reminder of a tree that used to be pervasive and, and powerful and it's, it's motivation. It's motivation to, and I, there's, a, there's a particular tree I take people to in Cape Elizabeth where I do a lot of my work that is, I think is the quintessential example of a, of a chestnut tree that has tried many generations in, of itself to produce a new stem and a new trunk to try to survive. And then the fungal blight kills it back. As so you see all of these different parts of the tree that were shot up from the roots, killed, the next one shoots up, killed. And now it's just down to, you know, maybe it's last couple hundred leaves is all it has. So it's a, it's a sad tree, but it's also a reminder of this is what we've done to the American chestnut tree. Everybody needs to look at a tree like that. And there's many other ones around. People, I'm sure, across Maine can find chestnut trees that look like that, that are, that are barely alive. They're barely surviving and being whacked back 
uh, mercilessly by the fungal, the accidentally imported fungal blight. So it's sad, but it's also super motivating because we think that if we can bring the chestnut back to the landscape, it's going to have so many reverberating effects and positive effects uh, across the ecology, as well as to reintroduce it to American cultures. So, so it's pretty, it's very exciting to, as somebody that, you know, I've been working on ecological restoration for decades, but to hone in on the American chestnut as being probably the most important species to, to bring back. If we can reverse this ecological disaster, it's going to be remarkable to, to go from, you know, again, from a dominant ke uh, keystone species to, to nothing but stump sprouts and then to re reintroduce it. And it's not going to be in, done within our uh, lifetime. This is going to take a long time, many decades into the future, but we can do all we can within our lifetime. You know, the old saying goes that um, society grows great when, when old men grow trees, they know they won't uh, sit under the, the shade of. So that's kind of what, what we think about. How can we make a positive impact and leave the earth hopefully a little bit better than we found it? Tom, I greatly appreciate your time. Um, and more importantly, I appreciate your work and your passion on this. I hope you keep us in the loop on, on next steps and what your, how the research is going. Uh, getting to a mature tree in four months is pretty awesome. Uh, and a, just a great science story. And thanks so much. Okay, yeah, really enjoyed chatting with you. And thanks for doing these podcasts, which are, which are awesome. Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The MSF team is ramping up for March 2022 and the expected and hopeful return of the Maine Science Festival. Until then, you can get excited about the MSF and help support us by getting your own themed t-shirt, mug, or even MSF trading cards. You can find our store on our website, mainesciencefestival.org, and via the link in the show notes. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I receive production support from Miranda Bouchard and social media support from Next Media. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker. <laughs>